Hey everybody, what's up? Alright, so this is going to be an uh, armchair expert's guide to writing video on um, plotting, pacing, outlining. And uh, like I said, it's a very popular question and a source of confusion um, for a lot of people who are getting into writing, so why not tackle it and try to make sense out of it? Um, I would say that I'm for the, you know, if I was to give my, define myself or put myself into a category as far as outlining goes, I would definitely be an architect far more than a gardener or pantser. I definitely have to have everything meticulously line, outlined and set in order of what needs to happen. Just because from a consuming or a consumer standpoint, when it comes to um, storytelling and like movies and books and comic books and video games uh, logical consistency is super important that's something that can really take me out of a story of any kind if there's too many issues going on where things aren't gelling up especially when you have films that are trying to use complicated I should just say films because films from a storytelling standpoint and from a inspirational standpoint are probably far more relevant to my writing than than books are as, just from a plain inspiration standpoint so those always are sources that I go back to even when I'm trying to study uh, techniques and whatnot so that, that I can apply to my own writing as far as the storytelling art goes so the more complicated a story the more logical consistency needs to be there otherwise it falls apart you get a lot of really un Un, uh, underwhelming endings and uh, unsatisfactory conclusions and tying up of loose ends when the, their logical consistency kind of falls apart. So I guess that's kind of made a strong impression on me where I really have to plot out things just very to the very minute detail or it seems off to me. I seem kind of lost. So maybe that's a shortcoming that I'll that I'll have to work on to maybe feel more, a little more comfortable, just kind of, you know, letting it flow and, and being more of an exploratory writer in a certain sense. But for now, it works for me. And so I'm not trying to impress upon everyone that that's the method in which they need to take. It's just, if you're going to describe outlining, you might as well give, you know, if you're it, it, describing outlining to someone that is going to be an architect, then you might as well do the full down in the minute and then give an example for those who don't like to outline a lot to see where the more extreme end of the spectrum is and then they can decide from there if that's what they want to do or if they just want to do it very simply so basically for me it's uh it's like connect the dots basically beginning middle end are the main you know the big dots you know first second third act or whatever for the sake of simplicity so basically, this has the story has to start at this point. We at some middle point ish. We need to be at this event or this. You know, these events have to have happened to lead up to this point, and then of course we have the ending. This is how the story has to end. And a lot of people don't have an ending when they come up with a story, which can be problematic. But most people can persevere and and get to the point where they hopefully before they're right at the ending they've got an idea to work with i like to have the ending figured out if possible it just makes things a lot easier because you can decide if you you know if you want to you just want to have a twist ending or if you if your em ending is more you know symbolic of a bigger message the message you're trying to impart on your audience and so on and so forth so knowing the ending is great obviously you need to know where the the beginning start or the story starts but sometimes you can come up with a beginning that um, is kind of you know not really getting the story starting at the point where it needs to be some people you know you kind of drag on at the beginning and that can kind of uh, cause boredom with the uh, with the uh, reader and if it, you're making an first impression on it you typically want to pull them in somehow which doesn't necessarily mean you have to have car chases and explosions and crazy stuff going on but it helps to make that initial impression so that the, the reader has an idea of what they're getting into and um, sometimes that's you know in, in the middle of a, a chase scene or something or maybe it starts out um, 
a little bit slower pace, but there's something in there that has to kind of give that initial concept of what kind of story you're telling, what you know, what kind of world it takes place, and you got to give a little bit of a glimpse so they can start to you know, have some more anticipation and understanding of the journey you're going to take them on. So that being said, I'm just going to do, do some quick little examples to show you that I came up with just to get a basic idea when it comes to to outlining and plotting right now. Then I'll show kind of a, another one that deals more with pacing. And then I have a, the final one, I have an example of actually my own series that I'm working on where I've got actually a, an excerpt from Scrivener, which is a writer program that you can um, buy and use. It's pretty handy. And uh, it kind of gives an idea of how I've broken down, I think it's like the first 20 chapters. And that I've already, even after having plot, set all that down, I'm already starting to change my mind. And I'll give examples of that when we get to there. All right, so let's get started. So this is basically a graphical representation of, say, a cork board, bulletin board, you know, three by five cards, which are a great way to to use to organize um, your story ideas. So when you're starting to kind of formulate your story, just think of events that need to take place in the story. You know, they can be super relevant and major plot points, or they can just be scenes that you really think are cool that you want to incorporate. You know, you want to have a big, uh, you want to have a duel or a big castle siege or a, a shootout or something, you know, or space, you know, a couple of spaceships, you know, flying around and, you know, fi firing at each other and trying to take the other one out. I'm going to start compiling a list of all these events and because at some point you're going to have to put them in a certain chronological order based on, like I said, logical consistency, how you want the story to um, develop and, you know, the, the kind of pacing you want to use because, you know, action scenes obviously have a different pacing than a more laid back, um, you know, introspective scene or something like that. So I'm using in this one, like a really generic, basic, like maybe children's like fantasy or fairy tale story with these really basic plot elements, you know, dragon attacks and a wizard and princess and magic sword and all that sort of thing. So this is just the first example is just using this would be the I'm by one one through six those that would be um, one being like chapter one or the first event if you want it could be a book that has this could be literally a book with six chapters and that's the event main event that happens in each and it's a short story or you could have like a hundred chapters and these are major plot points that have to happen along the way and you might have uh, you know ten or fifteen different chapters interspersed between certain events and or whatnot so we have a dragon attack and then a wizard appears. Um, and, and while we're, like I said, also while we're thinking about this, let's think about why, the whys. So for some reason, a dragon attacks. For some reason, right after that dragon attacks, or at least in our little short story example, a wizard appears. The protagonist um, finds out that from some source, we maybe it's the wizard, uh, that a uh, magic sword needs to be found. So we've got a magical item that needs to be found, you know, hero quest type of setup. We have to find, or, or the protagonist has to find a dragon's lair, so maybe that magic sword is in the dragon's lair, or maybe the, the protagonist has to find the magic sword and then go to the dragon's lair and kill the dragon, which, you know, of course is a real classic uh, story trope, killing, I mean, kill, I think they probably have named one after, you know, killing the dragon, and of course save the princess. So that's just kind of our basic um, plot structure. Pretty straightforward. No, no, you know, no real twists or turns. I mean, it's pretty much straightforward um, going from point A to point B. So that's just our first example in the second version of this. Now in this one, we have a wizard appearing first. So for some reason, a wizard is appearing, um, and then the it is followed by a dragon attack. So in this case, perhaps the wizard came to warn about a dragon attack, uh, and then the dragon attacks as um, he warned about. Perhaps the wizard showing up is the reason the dragon attacked, and that the wizard not, you know, if the wizard had not shown up, the dragon would have left, you know, his the hero's village alone or whatnot. And now we have um, finding the dragon's lair first. So in this one, um, 
we've got the dragon's lair happening before the magic sword, so perhaps the magic sword is located within the lair, so seeking the lair out itself. Or perhaps the um, protagonist goes to the dragon's lair to find the dragon, realizes he can't defeat the dragon, maybe he tries and gets defeated, and then he has to find the magic sword, then kill the dragon, then save the princess. So we need to, when we're looking at this, we need, also need to establish whether or not the dragon can or cannot be killed with, I mean, with, with or without the magic sword. So if we find out from, let's say, the wizard tells the, the protagonist that the magic sword is the only way that um, the dragon can be killed, then we've got this logical consistency where this event of finding the magic sword obviously has to take place before the dragon is killed. If you flip-flop on that, and um, all of a sudden the dragon is killed without a magic sword, then we need a reason why that is. Perhaps the wizard, um, you know, needed the... Maybe the wizard was tricking him to get this magic sword for another purpose, when in reality he never needed to have it to kill the dragon in the first place. So just, you know, understand when you set these rules, uh, storytelling rules, or that you need to follow them in a certain order, and maybe for some reason the magic sword, maybe the magic sword uh, severs the lock that's on the door that's, you know, in the tower that's the princess is in. And it has nothing to do with killing the dragon. So just consider, you have to consider all of these things. Because when you're plotting out, you know, chapters, and if there's certain events that have to take place logically within the story, you need to be aware of those. And you probably should be writing little notes. Because um, like I said... Readers, especially in the fantasy world, especially in um, very, you know, long, drawn-out series with tons of world-building, they love to nitpick and they love to find these little inconsistencies or plot holes. And, and if they're there, they'll find them. And if you don't have a reason or good enough explanation of why it happened that way, it's going to make you look really foolish and very amateurish. And, you know, even the best writers, even the most you know, famous writers make mistakes and have these issues but uh, you got to keep the, this process in the back of your head when you're plotting along because it'll really help you um, figure out what you can move around and what needs to be um, you know in order of you know chronologically what has to happen and I you know, like I said I definitely pay attention to that quite a bit when it comes to my own work all right so in this one this is more of a I would say like a hero quest setup where the wizard appears, perhaps he tells the protagonist, you know, you're destined, you must find this uh, magic sword before the dragon comes and destroys your village. So he finds the dragon's lair. Perhaps the dragon attacks him after, you know, he makes his appearance in there. Perhaps the dragon is guarding uh, the castle or the tower where the princess is uh, being held. And let's say in this one, um, maybe he manages to fight the dragon but uh, doesn't defeat the dragon, but was able to save the princess, and then has to go back and after the fact and kill the dragon. Perhaps maybe the maybe the hero and the princess manage to get back to his village, and the dragon follows him, and he kills a dragon back there. So instead of the dragon appearing in the village at the beginning of the story, he appears at the end of the story. Like I said, we've got these basically these six same um, plot points. And just showing you how you can rearrange them in different ways to tell, you know, a completely different story chronologically um, without, you know, really having to change the kind of the, the soul of the story of what what's taking place within the story. But like I said, if you have a cork board, you, I mean, those little bulletin boards you can buy, you know, at Walmart or something, buy some push pins, buy a bunch of 3x5 cards, you know, just write a basic concept of a story point, plot point on one of those cards and put put it up on the cork board. And you don't have to necessarily mark them, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I mean, you could make a little, like, a little column across the top that's separate that has, like, those. And then you can just move them around. Um, and you look at those, and you have the actual ideas out in front of you. It makes it a lot easier to conceptualize, as opposed to you're just sitting there daydreaming and all these thoughts are just kind of bouncing around and you don't really have a way to, you know, unless you have a kind of a very kind of unique way of visualizing things where you can actually do kind of almost make a mental bulletin board and move them around and keep them in order. More of like, you know, an idiot savant would. 
then having that visual representation up where you can actually physically move it around, see all these events, and then you might start to see, um, you know, different uh, ways in which they connect or that can different possibilities when you twist things and move things around. I think it's much more helpful than just kind of sitting there, you know, twiddling your thumbs, you know, kind of brainstorming without actually having something in front of you because you may be, you know, not all that excited or, or, you know, wanting to type everything out because you've got kind of that writer's block going on. So take a different approach and use some visual elements. So that's pretty much what this is representing. And then I th to this one is more um, figuring out like character relations in, in to where characters are located within the world itself because a lot of people will, will have these questions where well what if I have you know multiple kind of protagonists or, or multiple antagonists and they're all in different parts of the world um, at certain points in certain chapters you know how do I know or when they should kind of merge together and that sort of thing so this is really just another, you know, it's it's really kind of basic, uh, I, you know, because I'm, I'm no artist. This was all done in Word with, you know, some of the symbols and the shapes and objects that they have in there. So it was something I came up with. So this is like if you had basically had a protagonist and an antagonist, and those two are completely separate from one another as far as their physical location. And we can see that in relation to as, as the chapters go by, and the, the little gear symbol isn't anything it doesn't represent anything. It's just in line with where the chapter blocks are. So we've got that. So basically through, you got four chapters. You have the protagonist going along his um, storyline, his, you know, path. And then the antagonist is, you know, may not be written about in any, in those chapters. But we know that in sequentially and in time that uh, these events are taking place of the protagonist, this guy or this guy or gal or whatever is in another location, um, and their story is progressing as well. So that we know that they're in the world and and you know haven't have not you know yet to be um, introduced. So, like let's say yeah we have a evil overlord that's plotting a overthrow a kingdom and he's off in kind of the background doing his thing. So we know as the protagonist is starting out that this evil overlord's already put his uh, plans into motion. And so in this next one, we basically see that at, you know, at chapter one, the protagonist is where he's at and then the antagonist is moving towards the location of where the protagonist is at so that within chapter two and three, I just, you know, basically blue and red or purple. So we see that they're combined into the same chapter or at least into the same location and you know maybe interacting within that chapter or not and like i said you can do this for you know like for a bunch of different characters this is just kind of a another way of visually representing this this idea to help you know kind of you know brainstorm and so in the third example now we have the sidekick so we have a you know the, the side character and so in in this example they're all none of them have crossed paths yet so they've um Maybe they're aware of each other, but they haven't physically come in contact with each other. And so in this one, we see we've got the sidekick meeting up in the first chapter with the protagonist. So then in the second chapter, they're both together. And then in that second chapter, the antagonist is making his or her way over. And then in the third chapter, we have both the protagonist and sidekick together along with the antagonist. So maybe there's the first you know sh showdown or, or meeting that the two... Um, different sides of the, you know, of the battle um, have initially shown up. And then, you know, in the next chapter, you could show the red arrow moving off back to, you know, where the antagonist is. And let's say they, they defeated the antagonist initially, and he's off, and now he's back in his own location as the story continues. So just a, just another way of helping to visualize things, especially if you like, you know, using Photoshop or Microsoft Paint or anything like that to to draw these kind of things. It's, it's like I said, it's just another way of visualizing it um, and, and also keeping track of things and, and deciding whether, uh, where in the story you, you really want the, these characters to um, come into the, the same area and to interact in person. So that's that one. And this is more about pacing, and this is pretty much you've got a uh, beginning and end of the story. Um, high points and low points. Low points are basically the, 
when bad stuff happens to the main character and high points are more towards you know having success and and elevating themselves you know out of a position where they were you know in trouble and are you know are moving forward and making great progress because obviously the at the finish we're hope they're assuming that their end goal is going to be made and i can't remember i i did i had watched a series about movie making and script and uh, screenplay writing it dealt with this concept of having a certain number of bad things that basically have you know typically happen to a character uh throughout a story in a typical hollywood film not i mean not bad things but they basically moments where they have the rug pulled out from them when they're trying to make progress towards their goal so let's say here we start out and like i said maybe it's that uh initial story i was talking about let's say the dragon attack so um and uh burns the village down so at this point you know the characters um had the rug pulled out from their you know moving lower kind of you know in a worse position than they initially were at they, then they struggle, get back to kind of almost where they were initially as far as um, getting towards their goal. And then let's say they uh, he makes progress towards, you know, finding that magic sword. And now he's, you know, got that that magic sword, continues along. And then all of a sudden, um, let's say he's uh, camping out and a, and a group of bandits come and steal the magic sword. So, oh, crap, now he's down here. His uh, His situation has gotten a lot worse. And he's got to dig himself out of a hole, and let's say he's coming all the way up, and he's finally, let's say, he finally catches up with the bandits, and he accomplishes um, defeating them, which is a, you know, a huge accomplishment for him, since he's just, you know, a farm boy from a farm, and, you know, taking out a group of bandits like that is a quite an accomplishment for him, so now he's, you know, riding high. Maybe there's a little bit of a hiccup, let's say, the like, a bridge is washed out, and he has to make a, a way around to get to the dragon's lair so he's not completely you know horrible situation has happened but you know he's not as good off as he was when he defeated the bandit so he so he's moving along and let's say he finds an alternate route but then he goes and let's say along the way he has like a moment kind of like in uh, lord of the rings fellowship of the ring when gandalf fights the balrog and let's say the wizard was traveling along with him the whole time and then all of a sudden the wizard is you know killed off or or he's separated, so he's like this huge drop in, you know, where he's at as far as uh, being in a very, you know, bad position. The You know, the rug's been pulled out from under him again, and maybe he's making more progress, but he's st still struggling, and then let's say uh, something, you know, even worse happens for him. Let's say um, he finds a dragon, and, and the dragon, uh, for some reason, he's not able to defeat the dragon, and then he has to make this big comeback where he fights um, fights and kills the dragon, but let's say is ultimately he's still got to find out if the princess is okay, so he's almost back to where he was. And as far as being in a favorable position, and then at the end he uh, finally frees the princess, so he's better off than when he started, but he still has lost, you know, the wizard, let's say it was a mentor. So he's ultimately, with his goal, he's in a better position throughout from this entire character arc but he's still not you know you know is the king of the land and everybody's safe you know kind of in a, like a pg or g rated movie so he's better off but he's had a lot of you know uh, horrible things happen you know a lot of struggles and and tragedy that he's had to overcome so you can think of it as like a roller coaster ride and a lot of these things can um, represent tension as well where you have, you know, when you have like a, a moment where, you know, there's something horrible happens, it's a lot of tension, and then you're slowly building, climbing back out of that, you know, that deficit. And, you know, these kind of these high points could, you know, represent, you know, tense moments where these kind of flat points could represent just kind of moving along without a huge change in emotional um, tension or pitch or whatever you want to call it, if you want to think of it as music. So that's just kind of a basic idea. And you can, like I said, you can decide all you know all of these events that take place in your story and decide you know where the really tragic events what are the really triumphant events that take place and start plotting them out along that way it's like i said it's just another visual representation and you because like i said it is you're, it is kind of like a roller coaster where you, you you're doing these kind of slow build-ups to these you know high peaks and then you get this downward spot where the you know the roller coaster is just flying down the track 
going down to these lower spots where you get this real tense, this kind of fear because you know you're got those butterflies in your stomach from you know going through you know going for that big drop and then rising back up you know out of that feeling more feeling of safety and and things are going okay to drop you know down again and to get that anxiety and excitement. So that's kind of what that represents. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And last but not least, this is a um, print screen of my Scrivener uh, cork board. I, it's just the section. There's more to Scrivener than just this, but I edited the rest of it out so it was easy enough to uh, get on the screen to see. So you basically have um, a prologue, 20 chapters, and this is more or less how I want things to to play out but there are a few things that I may or may not change so essentially the the ex prologue which you know some people say well don't write prologues well I'm writing a prologue because this event that takes place on this um, island which I showed in the which you can see the actual world map of my r world and story and the map creation video this place called Sanguinestos is enshrouded in mist. The mists lift, and that is actually a very key event to the plot of getting put, moved forward and has to happen. So it's a required scene in the, in the story. That's why it's a prologue, and also because I wanted it to take place prior to the first chapter because that event has to take place for things to go forward, as I said. So the Merchant uh, Guild rep, sails to this place and um, after rumors of the mist having lifted so obviously that like i said the, that has to happen beforehand so that he can eventually hear about it and then decide to go to this um, island and so the and the contact with this island and this and this ruler that lives there is very is very important to um the the overall plot at least of the the first main you know story of the of the series the main character the protagonist Adric uh, his whole kind of inciting event is um, these prophetic dreams that he has initially he has one about his his um, long lost father which is also done in a dream sequence and I know people are like oh don't do that well I'm doing that and I know how to handle the dream sequence so that it's not a bunch of you know kind of gobbledygook and just a bunch of you know attempts to write poetic language and be all kind of trippy and stuff and like it serves a purpose and there's foreshadowing in it and then of course we he's a kind of, he's a farm boy you know he's a farm boy mc so that we get a, a bit of a glimpse of on his daily life and then doran who is the other main character see in this one he meets with um the newly crowned king of zastrova uh, in the south of, Zest of so or southern Zostrova as an emissary from the king of Atlatrona. Um, this chapter, the way I was talking about of changing, I may have him coming over, sailing over from another land and ending up in Atlatrona and then having this request uh, to talk with these, this newly crowned king happen in a following chapter and then introduce him because this is where I was going to introduce him like in the as a character in the story. From the first time and he's like he's the main main character of the entire series at least from the in the present day story so that's like i said that's a very important um you know first impression that you give your readers when this is the character that you know you're supposed to have them care about through you know multiple books so i definitely that's something i would de i'm definitely focus on as far as um where where's the best place to actually put um uh, that character in and as you can see it jumping over to chapter seven he speaks to, he returns to Alatrona, speaks with the king as well as the Alatronan merchant from the first chapter who like i said is with this merchant guild rep over here so these may get end up getting flipped because i may want him coming to Alatrona first talking to that guy then meeting with the king and then going and talking to the king of the other country so murzak uh, who is the antagonist, and his minions arrive in uh, Nit Voldenskog. They're looking for a long abandoned castle in the mountains. Like I said, you can see that not the castle isn't on the map yet, but you can get an idea of where that's located by looking at that other video. Wink, wink. So we go next to the capital of Zastrova. We get a look at the king regent, who is a younger brother of the 
newly crowned king who is obviously away, so he's acting as king regent. We learn that uh, their father has passed, and we get a little bit of a little bit of background on what's going on in that in that country because they're going to be one of the the main players in this upcoming political struggle. Uh, let's see. So the merchant guild rep and lord of Gonestos meet to talk business. We learn more about this land that's basically been isolated for 300 years um, from outside uh, communication and influence. So, like I said, it's a big this this the miss having lifted at this particular point in history is is very prophetic and important. So, I already talked about that one. Um, we're still dealing with Adric's life in his home village. We have a kind of a fall harvest celebration, which kind of shows some of the culture of his of his. Um, village and he's also interacting with two characters brother and sister who are actually the son and daughter of this merchant um that has is currently over in sanguinestos who's actually a, a manor lord in in this um character's village he's basically adric's basically kind of a country bumpkin of this um you know kind of more folky um shaman not really shamanistic but um polytheistic more like you know it'll be like more like iron age like ireland type of uh situation where this merchant is from the mainland and he's a manor lord that's basically all, all in in name only since these people are pretty much free to do as they want so he's kind of been this guy's been put in a pretty bad position by his uh, father who's the head honcho of the of the merchant guild it's basically put him over there and has you know just so that he can keep an eye on what's going on as far as the uh, crops and everything that gets harvested that gets traded from this place so he's looking for any reason to get the hell out of there so he's taking this kind of uh you know shot in the dark and meeting with this ruler that you know no you know, of a country that nobody's talked to for you know 300 years to see if he can set up a lucrative trade agreement and maybe get out of his uh crappy position as being the manor lord in this kind of backwater so a few we have that harvest festival um, a few weeks after the um, the harvest festival, this main or the the one of the two main characters, Adric, learns that his friends are gone, their family moved, so the brother and sister, um, they all moved to this new land in Sanguinestos, which so he uh, is not too happy about that. But again, he doesn't really have a reason to leave uh, his village yet. So we have Murzok, the antagonist, and his minions reaching the castle. They begin to explore, uncovering the hidden depths. So like I said, this castle is obviously there's something important there. They're taking all, making all this um, effort to try to explore it. Uh, Adric, again, we see that he has another prophetic dream, and he's actually becoming fit, ill as if he's coming down with some kind of sickness, which causes his mom to start to fear that, you know, he may not be long for this world. We have a chapter where his mother takes him to a village healer who begins to unravel the mystery of his dreams and i actually have decided that i'm gonna do more than just um have her initially she was just going to be the one that figured things out and set him forth on his mission but i was actually i'm actually going to add in a additional element of a uh, kind of an old crone or soothsayer type um, character that this, that he has to go to and she kind of reads his uh, future in the bones and gives him kind of a riddle or a mystery that he has to solve and then sends him on his way i thought it was a little bit more cryptic a little bit more foreshadowing and, and symbolism as to the some of the major themes in the story and i think it, it was kind of cool and i was reading some more history about ancient ireland and some of the folklore and some of the uh, geographic features of ireland and some of the burial mounds and stuff and i thought it'd be kind of a cool idea so murzok the antagonist who is at base he's a necromancer he finds what he's looking for at the castle, and we get some backstory on why he's shown up at this time and place. Um, Adric's friends arrive in Sanguinescos and have to adjust to their new life. The sister feels something is wrong from the start. She ends up becoming a point-of-view character who we see through her eyes all the events that are taking place there, which are, base are really important to the story, not to mention she is at least hinted at being a potential love interest for Adric in the beginning, even though they're still kids, you know, 11, 12 years old. So her well-being is, is important to the um, audience if, you know, if they start to, you know, want to cheer for Adric and hope that he can um, figure out how to save his friends. Um, like I said, in this one, the village healer decides to send Adric to Malithian to meet with a wizard that is in the service of the king. 
like I said, that's most likely going to change. She's probably going to refer, she's probably going to be come up with a no, you know, possible answer and refer to like a, you know, kind of a last ditch effort to have this um, soothsayer try to figure things out, which, you know, involves a little bit of witchcraft and stuff. So it's a little bit more ominous and spooky. So the king of Zastrova returns to the capital after his meeting with Doran, who is the, as the acting as the emissary of the king of Atlatrona. Um, and then um, he hears about activity at the abandoned castle um, at Nit Boldenskog, which is, and it's a castle that's been abandoned for close to 300 years. So there's a little bit of a tie in there. So obviously events of the past are starting to um, reappear or re play themselves again um so this is back in at sanguinestos um the female um, love interest of adric her brother is living it up because you know he's a little bit younger than her a little bit more naive and he thinks it's just great they're in this this new foreign country he's you know his father's you know made friends with the the ruler and they're you know kind of uh be, Autumn, you know, been given this boost to kind of being a part of the upper class, so he thinks it's great. He's probably being told that he's going to hold titles and land, and maybe he'll be a knight or something. So he's, you know, having a blast, and she th is totally worried about what's going on. She's starting to, she gets these, you know, impressions, and she's very inquisitive. And I actually talked about her in my, I think it was, the, it was I think the tropes video about the. Uh, detective princess or, or detective um, royalty or whatever type of character using those tropes and that's basically what her character is based on and Corbregat is the name of the castle so she starts to investigate um, with spring arrives um, Adric sets off to Malithian uh, because his prophetic dreams have basically shown his two friends being in danger and maybe and something horrible happening to him so that's his his initial motivation plus the fact that his dreams and what they're doing to him is you know could kill him if he just stays and does nothing so there's something tied in with you know his own well-being and his own health of moving forward on this quest and so he's got kind of a dual dual purpose to hopefully save them even though he doesn't know for sure what may or may not happen but also to um, you know protect his own um, life if you will so in this next chapter, we have the younger brother of the Zastrovan king. He's sent to investigate the activity of Murzok and his minions at the castle. And then Adric arrives at the home of a friend of the family who's a retired military leader. So this will probably end up staying in place. So this is kind of a contact point he has along the way as he's headed to the mainland to try and um, figure out what is going on. This guy's an ex-military uh, member i don't know if he's a leader or not but he's a, he's a retired military uh, guy from the kingdom of Malithian, so he probably has a, some connections so he can and you know and like i said adric's first time out away from his village on his own he needs some, you know a little bit of guidance so yeah i mean that was a little a little bit long uh, explanation but i'm um, hopefully all this stuff starts to make sense and this is how why how it and how i'm plotting out all these chapters and you can do the exact same thing either with Scrivener or just with a cork board and 3 by 5 cards. You can stand in front of that thing and, and, you know, do what ifs. You know, what if I moved this part to here, this part to here, and uh, then start, you know, typing up maybe some more descript, you know, description and, you know, some paragraphs in each one, you know, open up a separate word file for each chapter and start filling in some more info. Maybe some quotes come to mind that characters might say. Just like I said, just start filling that in, and then you've got way more to work with and this is like I said um, I may even break a chapter into something like this where I have beginning middle end of the chapter and what parts that I feel that I need to hit what overall the chapter needs to accomplish before I can move on to the next one what you know and I also need to remember the links from previous chapters since I'm jumping from points of view um, of what happened pr prior to that and so on and so forth so Hopefully that was uh, educational and informative in as far as um, getting a ba basic idea of how to approach um, plotting, pacing, and outlining. There's plenty more, you know, instructional videos and things online from different people. So keep on researching it. But like I said, 
before you go to a forum and before you go to you know a subreddit and start asking these questions you need to just sit down get this stuff out like this and to visualize it and just spend some time thinking it over and asking yourself the why is the who what where when and why and how type of questions until you're satisfied that you've got some consistency and logical reasons why things are happening and why they're in the place they are in the story and so forth do that do that legwork put in that effort um, don't just go and ask people to help you out and and to do it all for you because you with that mindset you're never gonna you know get past you know the first couple steps of the journey if you ever are at so early on asking for all this help with the heavy lifting and it just takes i mean like i said this is part of the imaginative creative process it's just brainstorming all this stuff out getting all these ideas out seeing where they fit and then starting to you know piece that that story together and so you get all these pieces start to interlock so that's it for this uh video i hope you liked it um i think i'll next series i'll do i'll work on i'll do magic systems just because that's again another huge question that people have and I, I'm not going to do like super in-depth how to build magic systems. I'm just going to come to more of a practical approach of the questions you should ask yourself of, you know, before, while you're doing the brainstorming process and all that and some things to keep in mind. But I'm not going to just like go through and build a magic system. I may describe the magic in my world as an example, like I use this as an example. But And what do you know, my alarm clock is going off, so... Uh, Time to head out, folks, if you can hear that. <laughs> I will talk to you all later. Take it easy.